Our third speakers are Oliver Skilton and Gillian Service. They are partners in Minted Ellison Rudd Watt. Um, and they are here to facilitate a practical legal session highlighting that leadership, engagement and cooperation between industry participants will improve worker health and safety. The complexity of relationships within the key fruit industry will be explored and they will show how overlapping duties need to be done well and well understood to ensure that risks are managed by the party that's in the best place to manage them. Welcome. Thank you, Kate, for that introduction. We thought we'd kick off this morning with a Slido, which I know that you guys have all been familiar with from uh, Hamish's presentation this morning. And we asked, posed the question there, how often do you keep workers safe? It's tracking pretty well, so much so that uh, starting to call, call into question why we're here, but um, no, it's great. And it's really good that, that uh, those discussions are already happening. So for me, the 15th of June 2017 was a pretty important day. It was a fairly standard Thursday. I was just checking emails, had calls with clients. Um, I was going out to, to see a client later on that afternoon. So it was all fairly standard stuff. Hit around 12.30, thinking about lunch. So nothing out of the ordinary. And I received a call from a client, a really good client, of the firm and he operates uh, with his business partner an inland shipping container yard and it's a really busy site it's one of those ones in South Auckland really really busy so they've got the shipping containers uh, are coming in so they liaise with the uh, with the shipping companies they've got the freight forwarders the logistic logistics companies so really busy about a hundred trucks are coming in and out every day and on top of that um, it's some fairly complex contractual arrangements as well uh, not only was the, uh, uh, the company structure quite complex, it's a joint venture and various subsidiaries, but they were dealing with numerous companies as well. So it was about lunchtime, about 12.30, and uh, Grant gave me a call. And he said, Ollie, one of my team, Herman, he's been killed. And what had happened was that Herman Topui, who was a supervisor on site, had walked across the container yard and was hit by a 40 ton container handler. And he died instantly. And we don't know why he did it. There's absolutely no idea. This is a company that had a good health and safety culture. WorkSafe had been on site, hadn't identified any issues previously, no improvement notices, good training record, golden rules on site. Yet there was Herman, 35 years old, four boys under 10 years old, and a wife, Milani, who he left behind. And so what went wrong? With all those systems in place, how was it that this happened? And I've thought about it a lot because, and I had, I had quite a bit of time to think about it, because this happened on the 15th of June, 2017. And the company decided, well, our charges were laid by WorkSafe, and the company decided, look, we'll, we'll plead guilty at the earliest opportunity. But sentencing only happened last month. And over that time, I, I've, I've thought a lot about it. And one of the real issues at the site was that health and safety, although it was there and was important to the company, it wasn't always at the forefront of everybody's mind as they came in and out of that site. And it wasn't just that company, not just Grant's company that was responsible for health and safety, each of those other companies played a role as well, and each of those other workers played a role as well. So I just wanted to start with that today for a couple of reasons. First, it illustrates just how quickly things can change. And for those of you who have been involved in health and safety incidents where there's been a serious harm suffered, you'll know that it's not something that you ever want to go through. Of course, there's the victims, the families, the company, the other workers. It's incredibly stressful in a, in, a, in, a, in a distressing time. So that leads on to my second point, that health and safety, not getting it right, can have those real consequences. 
And finally, health and safety is everybody's responsibility. And I can tell you firsthand that that's absolutely the case. So um, it is important that everybody does think about health and safety and think about the safety of workers. When you turn up onto a site and there might be many people um, or different, different entities there working together. So Gillian and I, we'd like a really interactive session today. I think that would be great if we can do that. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions as, as you go. We will kick off with a little bit of the law. Um, we are lawyers, so we will do that just to, just to set the scene, but we promise not to, to dwell on that. So I'll pass over to Gillian. You're in charge of that. I'm in charge of that. Well done, thank you. So here's what we're going to cover. Uh, firstly, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the legislation. We're going to talk about PCBUs and we're going to talk about those overlapping duties and how they work in practice. Uh, and to give you a framework of the legislation for what then follows in the session that we want to run, because we're going to get into a practical session, really thinking about an active scenario based around an orchard. All right, so this is the scheme of the act. And Ollie's heard me say this many times, but I'm going to say it again for you. This is my favorite slide that I ever look at in a presentation about health and safety. And it's my favorite slide because of the simplicity that it brings to what otherwise people say are complex arrangements. It's my favorite slide because if you drop this slide across any factual situation, you can work out whose duties belong where and where you sit within the framework. And so I've seen a few people taking a photo of it. Make sure you take a photo of it. Take it away with you. Because if you're thinking about whose duty is what, if you're having a debate about whose obligation is it, this slide really helps. And it takes a complex piece of legislation that's got many, many sections, and it puts it into a really, really simple infographic. I'd love to say that I created it, but I didn't. It was one of my fellow partners who works in this space, and she takes all the credit for that. But what does it mean? So firstly, PCBUs a person conducting a business or undertaking. Everyone in the room here works for a PCBU. So let's just think about who they might be. Um, well, Mintrellis and Rudd Watts, we're a PCBU. Uh, we've got Zespri in the room, they're a PCBU. Um, shout out some other names of PCBUs in the room. Who have we got? Yep, a couple more. East Pack, yep. Which one? Apata? Great, right, we've got some PCBUs. Everyone's getting the idea of what a PCBU is. So whilst the definition is a person conducting a business or undertaking, and the definition sometimes makes people think it's, it's me, I'm an individual, it's, it's the organization. So if you're, if you're a worker, it's invariably the entity you're working for. Now, why is that important? The PCBU, the, all of those names that we've just thrown out there, those entities have the primary duty for ensuring safety of workers. So the duty sits with the organization and its duty is to ensure the safety of the workers and the others in the workplace. And that's why there's those two arrows flowing down to the, the workers and the others in the workplace. So when you think about the workers, well, that's the people that you work alongside. The, the others in the workplace might be members of the public, perhaps, and people who are passing through the areas where work is being carried out. Then the other uh, element is the director's duties. And that's if you're a director or an officer of a company, you have a duty of due diligence to oversee the PCBU, oversee the organization, and hold it to account to check it, to make sure it's doing what it should do under the, under the legislation to fulfill its obligations. And that due diligence duty does bring with it some personal liability for the directors and the officers who are sitting off into, into that bucket that you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen. So that's the scheme of the act. We've got the primary duty of the PCBU to ensure the safety of workers. And then we've got the due diligence duty uh, of, of the directors and officers to hold the PCBU to account. Also in that is the workers' duties, because workers have the duty to conduct work safely as well. And we need to think about that in every health and safety discussion. So there we are, that's my favorite slide. That is our scheme of the act. And I'll just touch on a couple more points uh, and around what does it look like. So in this, in this scenario, we're thinking about who 
Now, we, again, this, this slide extrapolates the last one. It just drills into a little bit more detail. Uh, but I would always go back to that first slide for the simplicity of it. But again, it's talking about who, the PCBUs, who are the organizations in the room, um, what do they owe, and what are the duties, and to whom do they owe them? It's all making sense? Lots of nods, great, excellent. Let's move on, Ollie. Okay, so over to you on Reasonably Practicable. So one of the core concepts in the Act is to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure the health and safety of workers and others on the work site. And the, the way that this is works, I won't, I won't go through all of them, but what it really requires is an assessment of the risks and, a, and an assessment of the likelihood of harm that might come about as a result of the risk actually uh, occurring. And it's all about proportionality. And I think that, um, and this is just a personal view that I hold, but I think, um, I think many PCBUs get sort of hung up on this and they think that the Act actually requires entities to spend a lot of money on risks that are unlikely to eventuate, or if they do eventuate, then um, a lot of money needs to be spent on eliminating them. And that's actually not the case. The Act, the, one of the beauties about the Act is that it provides a lot of flexibility for entities to actually think, okay, this risk arises, how are we going to control it? And that proportionality aspect, which comes into it, means that, you could, that you're not expected to spend a whole bunch of money on risks that are unlikely to occur or will not cause much harm. So I like to use the example, you might have um, stairs where people will slip and trip. You're not required to put a lift in um, just because people do that. But if you have a serious harm, and you've identified that you've got a serious harm in, the, in, 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 in your organisation, something um, that might actually um, you know, cause, cause somebody to, um, I don't know, lo lo uh, to, to lo lose a finger, for example, then you are expected to put either elimination controls or minimisation controls in place. And these, these things in the Act, uh, that are set out in the Act, just actually enable you to go through those steps. One of the other, and this is the final course or concept that we want to go through just on the legal sides of things this morning, is that of overlapping duties. So I talked about in the case of, of Herman's workplace where there are lots of different entities coming on site. You know, there were the shipping companies, there were the freight forwarders, the logistics companies, and the company's own workers. And on that particular site, and I suspect it's the same, because we'll work through an example shortly, but I suspect it's the same uh, for the industries that, for, for the kiwi fruit industry, where you have a single workplace, but there's multiple PCBUs that have responsibilities on that one site. And that's really important to think, to, to keep in mind. And the Act now actually replace, places an obligation on all those different PCBUs, those entities on site, to consult cooperate and coordinate. And this all came about from Pike River where uh, I was one of the lawyers acting for the company when it happened. And what came out from the Royal Commission of Inquiry was that PCBUs were acting in siloed ways. They weren't talking to each other. And we know that it had tragic consequences. And so what the Royal Commission, borrowing from the Australian legislation that they looked at, was, okay, well, how do we actually really place a requirement, an obligation on PCBUs to talk to each other and ensure that they actually talk to each other about the risks so that they don't think, oh, well, that's Bob's risk over there, mine's over here. So what we're going to do now is actually run through a practical example. I appreciate that a lot of you will be very familiar with the legislative background already. So we'll move on to the practical example, but keep those legal things in mind. So if we pull the threads together of that legal framework, and particularly thinking about those duties that Ollie was just talking about, to consult, cooperate, and coordinate, to actually get together on an issue and work out how it's going to be best addressed, we're going to take you through a, a, a scenario. So think in your mind and picture in your mind um, an orchard. Pick your, pick your favourite one, or maybe not your favourite one, maybe one that you don't even like going to, but think of one and hold that name in your mind. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine the people that work there? Can you imagine the owner and the orchard management company? Has everyone got that in their head? You've picked one? 
Okay. So this orchard, it's well maintained, um, but despite being well maintained, there are a few potholes on the access way in. And a key thing to bear in mind when we work through this scenario is that the responsibility for maintaining the access way falls on the orchard owner. And that's been agreed with the, the orchard management company. So as I talk about this scenario, I've just given you two of the first things which are important to remember. So the first two things are that there's responsibility for maintaining the access way falling on the orchard owner. And that has been agreed with the orchard management company. So there's two important things to remember. Now, our orchard that we're thinking about is in really great condition. There is easy picking and it's well run. Now, the orchard management company has a good health and safety plan in place and it does list all the main risks to workers and as you would expect, has the appropriate controls mentioned and, and listed as well. And it also has uh, something else that's important when we think about our scenario. It has things like an established speed limit on site of 10 k's an hour. That's the third thing I want you to remember. And it's got, as you would expect, the requirement for pedestrians to be wearing high vis. Fourth thing that I want you to remember. That plan has not been reviewed in the past few years, but the orchard hasn't really changed and the operations haven't really changed. Um, so it's not been looked at in the past and the management company have been working there without incident for a couple of years. And from the orchard's perspective, well, we say, well, health and safety is common sense, isn't it? Now, the orchard management company, they dust off their management plan and they provide that plan to the picking contractor. All sounding fairly standard so far? nods around the room. By making the picking contractor aware of the risks on the property, which is in the health and safety management plan, the orchard management company thinks it's done its job. Has it? We're going to move to a slido. Let's pause and gauge whether the orchard management company is right in thinking that it's done its job from a health and safety perspective by giving that plan that mentions the 10K an hour and mentions the high-vis vests. Has it done its job by giving that to the picking company? So a good majority in favor of saying that there's so much more to be done. Well, a bit like Ollie said at the beginning, we, we could maybe go home now. Um, absolutely right, there is so much more to be done. You guys are onto it. Um, Whilst uh, the main risks have been identified and informed to the picking contractor, the other sorts of things that could be done, I mean, there's any number if you think about them. So for example, reviewing the plan regularly would be a good idea. Um, it could have been looked at in the context of, and, and, and Hamish was talking about this in the last session, talking about sharing information around near misses. So if you imagine a scenario where if you'd been recording near misses and that information could be shared uh, as part of a review of the plan each year, your plan would continually improve because for each near miss, that could be your next accident waiting to happen. There's also the opportunity for, if you think again about that slide that we had up a moment ago where you've got the different circles of the different PCBUs and the obligation to consult, cooperate and coordinate, there's an opportunity for the orchard management company to actually be getting some input on its plan and going off and consulting and coordinating and cooperating with the picking contractor on what are the issues on site. And uh, Kate had mentioned in when she was speaking about Hamish's session around how in the job that she does, often it's going back to people and saying, what's the system that you run? And actually, I've, I've written up an SOP, but as an individual working with that SOP, is this actually what happens? And if it isn't, should we change it? And if we should change it, how should we change it? What would it benefit from and what would it Im be improved by? Um, the other things that the plan could be improved by is actually just looking more widely and looking at what are other people in the industry doing? 
What is WorkSafe saying? What can we learn from that intel that is, is sitting within the industry? So rather than having it as a lovely document that gets created and just sits stagnant, it should be a, a document that is continually evolving. Because let's face it, workplaces are not static. They're comp continually evolving, either through technology, through the introduction of different people, through the introduction of different systems, and, and particularly in, in this industry, when you think about the impact that we also have to deal with around weather events and, and what, what is just generally Mother Nature throwing at us. All right, so let's move on to how our scenario develops. So the picking contractor engaged by Post Harvest has a picking team of about 20 in their, in their crew. And the picking contractor is a newly formed company. So there's no track record to review. But in any event, Post Harvest seems to just take that on board and they think, well, OK, well, there's no track record, so we can't do any due diligence, can we? And so the question to be thinking about is, well, should Post Harvest have done some more to assure itself that this picking crew could do the job safely right at the outset? Could they? Or should they? Yep, lots of nods, lots of yeses. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the key things it could have thought of was, well, to actually think about, well, the makeup of the crew. So on the first day of the season, when I moved to the first day of the season, it's all go, obviously. In the Orchard Management Company, it's on site, as you'd expect it to be. And it's there to meet the picking gang. For most of the crew, English is a second language. Now, this crew is made up of a mix of experienced pickers and those who haven't done it before. Now, Post Harvest weren't aware of that at the time, but that's fortuitously what, we, uh, what, we've, what we've got here. So we've got a mix. And that, of course, helps, because you've got an expectation that those experienced Members of the crew will help those who are learning how to do the job, not only just from a technical point of view of, the, um, of, of what um, fruit to actually pick, but of course from a safety perspective as well. Now there's a safety briefing, first thing, and it's a pretty quick run through of the key risks. I mean, as Gillian said, health and safety, it's, uh, it is common sense, right? And it's all in English. And there's no pictures. And to be honest, most are pretty bored by the routine, particularly the experienced ones. And that's common. I see that a lot across different industries. And true to form, they are asked to sign an attendance sheet saying, yep, we were here. And second, and this is even, this is the good part, particularly for the lawyers, they understood everything in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, health and safety briefing. So again, is this high level briefing sufficient for the first day of the season? Is it enough? And I would say no, no, it's not enough. And what else could be done? Well, the first thing is to recognize that English isn't the first language of everyone in the crew. And then to actually think, okay, well, how do we address this problem? And one of the good things about the Act, and this is what I said at the start, is it might not be the same for every, for, for every company, for every PCBU. There might be sort of a set standard across the industry of an expectation, but, you, but there's nothing stopping a PCBU from actually thinking outside the box and thinking, well, this actually, I think this will work, and to put that into practice. So considering about how best to actually convey that information to such a crew. So maybe it involves actually a face-to-face -face walk around focusing on the critical risks, you know, starting a little bit earlier in the, in the morning, keeping in mind that the, the, the workers need to get out onto, onto the orchard, slowing the whole safety briefing down, asking questions as you go to actually ensure some form of understanding, and really thinking about those critical risks. Because most of the time, incidents that happen are not those that just come out of the blue. They're, they're actually those that the company's already identified as being critical risks. So that might involve, for example, 
actually showing the workers, well, hey, this is a no-go zone for pedestrians. The next thing is to really try to move away from thinking of health and safety as a compliance exercise. And that's something that WorkSafe, um, Al, are you in the room? I, yes, Al's there in the room. I'm sure you do say this a lot. Move away from it, thinking, of, thinking about it as a tick the box compliance exercise. Many of you, um, I think one of the sponsors has a health and safety app and that's absolutely great. That's fantastic as, as, as helping or being part of the suite of things that you use to keep workers safe. But also think about, well, what, what, what does it not provide, provide for me? Is it actually that one-stop shop? And it might not be. So the picking crew has been working hard since 7am to pick the fruit. And part of this is because of the Kiwi start. Payments were at the start of the, start of the season, and that's a, that's a real incentive to get, that, uh, to get the fruit off the, the vines. The weather, it's looking pretty average, particularly towards the end of the week. So it'd be good to get the fruit off. Now, not long after the, uh, the picking starts in the morning, one of the experienced workers gets pretty close to a tractor on site. And others saw it, but no one says anything. So just ask yourself, well, what does that suggest? We've got an experienced worker on site and no one says a thing. And there might be good reasons. I've turned up to plenty of sites where the newbies don't want to say something to an experienced worker. I mean, crikey, you don't want to put a, put a foot wrong on your first day. But what it does suggest to me, just looking at it objectively, it says that there is work to do on the safety at the site and in terms of the culture, the health and safety culture that's actually developed on site as well. So safe sites have generally developed those health and safety cultures where it's not only okay, but absolutely expected that unsafe practices will be called out. Now go back, right back to the start of the session with Herman. Herman was a supervisor. He was working with 60 other people on site that day. No one said a thing when he did not use that designated walkway and he walked across the container yard. And what that suggested to me, at the, well, not right at the time, to be fair, but you know, many months later, was that there was, a, there was an issue with the culture at the site where that sort of behaviour wasn't called out. And I suggest in, my, in our hypothetical scenario that that would also be an issue here. So think of health and safety, and I, I do encourage everyone to... to um, to say this to, to the workers on site is to think of it as a team effort of keeping everybody safe on site. Now just to add a, a further dynamic into this, into this mix, the crew's a tractor driver down. So the normal tractor driver, the one who's been deemed competent and qualified to drive the tractor, he's called in sick. It's an unfortunate start to this picking season. Um, it might not look good for the rest of the season, but he's called in sick. And so the supervisor has to drive the tractor instead. And it's an old Massey Ferguson with the, uh, the usual tractor having broken down. So just a few more facts there, and I'll hand over to Gillian to take it to the next step. So at this point, you might be all sitting there thinking, this is all beginning to sound a little bit far-fetched with all our various different things on this particular day that are not quite lining up as we would want. And that actually none of these things would happen at the same time. But one thing from experience that we see a lot is that in any accident, it's the combination of many factors coming together that creates the accident. And any one of them being absent could have meant that the accident didn't happen. It's so frequent. If our tractor hadn't broken down, or if our driver hadn't been sick, or if the weather was maybe just a little bit different for that week, or if our crew wasn't the crew that we had and it was actually 
a, a more experienced crew. Any one of those factors could change what I'm about to tell you next, because the unfortunate reality of health and safety of incidents is it's the coming together of what are in and of themselves sometimes small that combine to make the outcome. So as Ollie mentioned, it's, it's, we're, we've got a forecast ahead of us where there's some wet weather coming and it's now mid-afternoon and it's starting to get a little bit drizzly and the picking has been quick. And that's meant that the supervisor is really keen and eager to get round the orchard and, and get the bins in and he's, he's on the tractor, different tractor, not the one that they're used to, and it's going around, he's going around at about 20 k's an hour. Has anyone told the supervisor to slow down? Well, no, because he's the supervisor, right? Um, must be fine, because he should know. And actually, nobody really is aware of what the speed limit is, because those 10k an hour signs that were around site are quite old and faded. There's been a couple knocked over. They're sitting in a bush. Um, so actually, 10k an hour is not that visible around site anyway. So people might not know to call them out on it. And then the supervisor hits a pothole on that road, that access road that I talked about at the beginning. He hits the pothole and he loses control of the tractor that he's not used to driving. And he's seriously injured. And in that accident, uh, that accident prompts the notification under the statute to work safe and an investigation of the incident starts. So going back to, to Slido, let's ask ourselves a few questions. I mean, was the supervisor right? Was he driving too fast? Should he have known the rules? Should he have known about the 10 k's an hour? Um, but what else could have gone uh, contrib contributed to this? Who overall has the responsibility for, for this incident? And you'll see up there, we've put a few options for you to pick from. So is it Zespri? Um, is it the orchard owner? I mean, if you think back to what I said at the beginning around who has responsibility for maintaining the access way, and that's an access way, remember, that's now got some potholes in it. Is it the orchard management company? Remember the agreement with the orchard management company around the potholes. Uh, the orchard owner's not on site, so he's not there to see what's going on. And what about post-harvest? Or is it the picking contractor? And what about the responsibility of that worker? the supervisor, who was the one at the end of the day, got in the tractor and was driving around quickly, too quickly, to handle the tractor that he wasn't familiar with. So who's got no responsibility? The majority saying that no responsibility sits with the Zespri, but we've got some elements of responsibility sitting elsewhere. So if we say no responsibility was desperate, well, if we think about that, um, is that right? When we think about consult, cooperate and coordinate, um, there's that obligation for all parties to be thinking about the role that they may play in a health and safety incident. And if you think back to what Ollie was talking about when we, we talked about that last duty with the, the circles on the slide, where we talked about consult, co cooperate and coordinate, and the very strong reason why, when this legislation was changed, this duty was put in, is to make sure that everybody has ownership of health and safety risks to the extent that they can influence and control the outcome. And when you think about all of the different players, What's the extent to which influence and control fits with each one of them? Because there is a role for every party to play, but it's, going to, it's not going to be equal because it's going to depend on the extent to which each party can actually influence and control the safety risk. 
you know, workers have a duty to make sure they are doing things safely. So certainly the driver, the supervisor, should absolutely not have been going 20 k's an hour. But at the same token, what about those responsibilities that sit around maintaining the road? And what about the responsibilities to make sure everyone's working together to get the right outcome for the end of the day? Because nobody wanted the supervisor to be hurt. Nobody wanted him to be going to a hospital rather than home safely. The reason why we wanted to focus on this as an example is to really get you to think about the different roles that each entity play within your industry and the importance of coming together to actually work on the safety plans to make sure that each entity that has a role in the risk um, has a voice in how it's managed. Yeah, I think that's a really important point around the influence and control. The, the legislation itself still anticipates that different PCBUs will have those discussions, but it's the discussions that must happen. So it's okay for one PCBU to actually think and say to the other PCBU, well, look, you're, you are best placed to deal with that particular risk. And for the other PCBU to, to recognize that. But it's those discussions and that common understanding that needs to occur. So running through them, um, about who had responsibility in this incident, this hypothetical that we've run through. So Gillian mentioned on Zespri, and uh, oh, I've lost the slides. I've lost the slide over. That's okay. Um, I think it was about seventy-nine percent thought that Zespri had no responsibility. And and look, that may well be right. But at least consider. Well, what about those Kiwi Start payments? Has the industry inadvertently created a system which doesn't, which, which might actually have some health and safety consequences? An incentive to work too quickly. The orchard owner. Well, in the scenario that we ran through, the orchard owner had actually done what they were meant to do and had that discussion with the orchard management company around maintaining the access way. And it hadn't done so, there were potholes. So the orchard management company, was its level of consultation sufficient with the orchard owner? I mean, it had turned up on site and there were still potholes. What had it done about it? Had it contacted the owner? What about its health and safety briefings at the start? Were they sufficient, particularly given the makeup of the crew? And was it also inadvertently placing a lot too much pressure on the picking contractor given that the weather was closing in and it wanted to get the fruit off the vines? Post-harvest. What about its due diligence that we talked about at the start of this? In a circumstance where you're dealing with a newly formed company and it might be a bit challenging to actually get the information you need to be able to assess, well, is this a good picking crew or not? And where does it sit in terms of that inadvertent pressure that might be placed on the picking crew to get the fruit off the vines as well? Something just to think about for post-harvest. The picking contractor. Well, the picking contractor, and this is the real rub, is that it's actually responsible for its, its, its supervisor who had the crash. So what its workers get up to are attributable to the picking contractor. In post-incident, the picking contractor should be asking itself questions such as, well, why did the other workers not call out that unsafe behavior? They're driving too fast. And how do we address that now? Why didn't it ensure that its tractor was in good condition? Why had it not thought about that scenario where its main, its main tractor had not been um, uh, fit, fit for purpose on the day? And why did it ensure that it had a backup driver who was competent and able to drive that tractor safely? 
on the day. So it all just leads us to this point, well, was this supervisor, was he actually set up to fail? I'd argue, no, he wasn't set up to fail. He needs to take some responsibility for his actions. But everybody had a, a lot of different entities had a role to play in this incident. And what we can see from this is that any incident is very rarely is it one person's fault. And I don't know if WorkSafe actually do this, but I always say, imagine that they do. Oh, you'll be able to fill, fill me in. Um, but after, after, after an incident, I always just imagine WorkSafe actually thinking, well, who, who, who are the relevant PCBUs on site here? And, work, and using that as their starting point. And I think we can tell from this incident that there were numerous PCBUs that at least had some role to play. And from the Slido, we can see that this room thinks much the same. So I'm going to just hand over to Gillian to, for, the, for the takeaways, but we do encourage questions if you do have any. Thanks, Ali. So what are the takeaways? We've talked about the legislative framework, but we've tried to put it into something practical that aligns to your industry that you can really uh, affiliate to and see sense in and recognize. The main purpose of the legislation is to keep workers safe. No one wants to get the phone call uh, that a worker has been injured, let alone has been killed. And so it's important for us all to think, to think about this web of responsibility. Everyone's got a role to play. And I often think about it um, a bit like um, this, this idea that we're all interconnected. And certainly under the old system, the old legal system for health and safety, safety was kind of handed like a baton in a relay race. You remember like doing the the 100, the four by 100 really race at school. And you'd have the bat and then you'd pass it to someone else. And, and safety was often thought of like that. I'd carry out my safety tasks and I'd give it to you and it's now your responsibility. You'll do your bit and then it's your responsibility. The framework we have now puts that to one side. It, safety is not a baton to be passed from person to person and to be palmed off on someone else. It's actually something that the legislation intends us all to wrap our arms around. We all have a role to play in keeping workers safe. And to Ollie's point, it will differ depending on what your role is and depending on what the particular risk is. But that just because your role might be less than someone's, someone else's doesn't mean you have no role. Because again, if we go back to that idea of what makes up an accident, which is many different things all happening at once that you hope never happen at once. If everyone's involved in making sure the, the thing that they're responsible for is taken care of, then we're much more likely to keep workers safe. So think about the extent to which you can influence and control. Because sometimes it's not a practical thing that you can do, like filling a pothole. It might be having a conversation. It might be creating a culture within worker, your workforce where you're encouraging people to speak up about safety issues. I've worked with an organization yeah. where their goal was to maximize near miss reporting because their view was that every near miss could be tomorrow's accident if the right set of factors are at play. And so if you can encourage near misreporting and move into that space where those lead you towards better safety outcomes, because those are your, are your lead indicators to what could come next. And if you can actually encourage near misreporting, you can share that information. Uh, to Hamish's point from his last session, sharing it not just within your groups that you work with, but actually as an industry. Because again, what could be today's near miss could be tomorrow's accident if the right set of factors are all falling into play. And consider how you can coordinate with others in that sense, because the statute is not just the good thing to do. The statute says you have to. It's a statutory duty, and it's a duty that uh, WorkSafe can prosecute for 
in the absence of even being a, there even being an incident. Uh, so there is a positive duty to consult, cooperate and coordinate. We often talk about it as the three C's. So what we'd really love you to take away from this session is really thinking about those three C's. Consult, cooperate and coordinate amongst each other in this room. The next coffee break you have over lunch, start thinking about how you can all work together because working together is how you genuinely create better outcomes for everybody within your organization and within the industry. So with that, I will pass over to any questions. You'll be pleased to hear we're done with Slido. So it's now time to stick your hand up, use your voice and ask us anything that you want to know. Do you want to join Ellie? Angus. Yeah, the, um, in terms of the likelihood of the risk, what we've seen is that, um, and it does build on a point that I, that I did make, where incidents do not tend to come out of the blue. There tends to be a track record, either through good reporting, like the near miss reporting, and actually you touched on this too, Hamish, it's, it's really important, it's not seen as, I've, I, I, I've seen directors of large companies who are absolutely irate when they're told that they've got a perfect health and safety record, and that there's no near misses. That suggests a problem. So it's through tracking and monitoring the, um, the, the near misses and the, uh, and, and the health and safety reporting, which is really important, and also knowing what else is going on in the industry, and that's why I was really encouraged to hear Hamish say, um, well, look, as an industry, work together on this. Because once you've done that, then, and you've really identified what those critical risks are, then you'll see how, just how, how likely they are. And, um, uh, and there won't be any great secret, I suspect. But the one th the, some of the things I have seen work well is uh, re that whole recognition of good safety outcomes. I mean, we all love to know when we've done well. We all like to, you know, back to school days, getting a gold star or a pat on the back. And how do you make calling out a safety issue? You know, so taking, for example, the Herman scenario, how do you, how do you make it a positive thing to say to someone, don't do that? And how do you actually get people to engage in that sort of behavior? And, and often it's, 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 it's putting towards outcomes. One organization I've worked with who've done it really well is, they, uh, is an organization where they've, they've kind of, they had a very compliance-based approach and they wanted to shift the mindset. And they actually did it using the families and friends of wor injured workers. Um, and there's nothing more compelling to change the cynic who's in the compliance mode than sitting in a room or watching a video of someone describing the loss of a loved one, or if it's about themselves, if they're sitting in a wheelchair because they can't walk anymore, or they've, they've lost their foot, or they've lost their hand and they can't, and it, any incident that Ollie and I deal with, when you read the victim impact statements, you always hear things like, and, and this is one of the last ones I did was, um, the person had, uh, their hand had been chewed up in a machine and they played the piano. They don't play the piano anymore. And when you hear a worker talk about that and then you watch the impact on everyone else around them, it's taking that and somehow connecting that to the right behaviors and making it a good thing to call out when something's wrong. And at a high level from a management perspective as well, looking in and saying, if that is not happening, to, to Ollie's point, if you're not getting incidents reported, and if you're in a near miss reporting phase and you're not getting near misses, it's because people aren't feeling like they can. So how do you, how do you shift that dial? And I, I've seen some organizations actively incentivize and put targets in place for near misses to really encourage near misses. First, putting an app in place to make it really easy, but then saying you have a target as a division, as an entity, as an organization to actually report. And we expect to see near misses of this number. And by saying we expect near misses of this number, it suddenly makes it okay to report them because people go, well, if we've got zero, we're failing in that metric. We're failing in that measure. 
And that's just one way that I've seen some organizations try and shift the dial from compliance through to actually a genuine interest in getting the right outcomes. I don't think you, you should, shouldn't be left wondering um, as to what the actual position is. So when COVID came on and, and happened and you didn't want to go onto the orchard, I think you wanted to actually you know, speak to the orchard management company and actually say, well, look, this is the, the position. And in this circumstance, I would usually take on these risks, but I can't and I'm not going to. Um, that's going to fall on you. And to have that discussion so you can have that understanding, that's what the Act requires. I wouldn't get hung up with what WorkSafe may or may not do. It's all about thinking, OK, well, are those risks being catered for and are they being addressed in a way that I'm comfortable with? There, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good stuff actually in this space around how do you actually have that challenging conversation and do it in a way that's constructive. Uh, so how you can go into a conversation and and you start it not by what were you doing, um, and it starts with more a are you okay? I want to understand why you've made this decision. What's what's happening for you right now? Because it might be I'm running late. Um, I'm actually not feeling that well myself, or I've just been told I need to do ABC, or whatever it might be. Um, there's usually a reason why somebody's doing something odd, and actually just actually approaching it from a I'm not here to tell you off. I'm actually here to try and understand. That would be my best guidance around that. Um, and there is actually um, a couple of consultants that we've worked with uh, who can help coach workers on having challenging conversations. So. It's not that this is um, something that uh, isn't going without help, and there is places you can get help to help a workforce tackle those difficult conversations. And it needs to be led from the top, because if you have, a, I think, a command and control style of leadership, then the temptation will be that that, cu that culture will flow through the organization. And so it's more how do you actually have, um, a, to, to your point, a, a caring approach to say, what, what is going on at the moment? Can I help? This was a bit odd. Um, how can we understand? How can we how can we help make better decisions? Yeah. One of the really difficult scenarios happens when you've had that discussion, and then the person does the same thing second, third, fourth time. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> um, but those, those, those are very, that, that's a different type of discussion, I think, that will be happening the yeah. second, third, fourth time. Yep, and one of the other things I do a lot of is employment law. Um, and I do have organizations that I've represented, actually one of them is based in this region, where uh, there was a worker who was doing exactly that, and that worker lost their job um, because it was not considered good enough. There was plenty of warnings, there was plenty of education, and there was a point at which the employer said, actually, enough's enough. Um, and unfortunately, that, that does form part of the matrix, but you'd like to hope that you don't have to end up there because uh, it's all about choice. We all choose how we behave each day and sometimes just understanding why people are making choices that are not smart. Um, uh, somebody, a uh, consultant I work with, um, used an example where there was a worker who needed to wear safety glasses um, and she never had them on and she worked in an area where there was steam and uh, one of the questions was, you know, why are you not? Why are you not wearing your glasses? Help me understand. They were always either up on her head or on her shirt. She had them with her, but she was never wearing them. And the the answer was, they just don't fit me, and they keep sliding off my nose, and so I can never see what I'm doing. And then if, if I get the other ones, they sit too close, and then they steam up, and I can never see what I'm doing. And so actually, with that worker, just trying to understand, what we needed was better kit, and it needed to be fitted properly. Um, and so going back to, to Ellen's point, conversation, communication, asking the question, because um, sometimes there is an easy fix um, and other times there's not and hard decisions do need to be made. One of the things I've certainly spoken to many organizations around is if you have a strong health and safety culture, so many things become a lot easier for you. Firstly, workers want to work with you and they don't leave. That's helpful. Secondly, you get known in the market for having a really good safety record. And if you're known in the market for having a good safety record and you're easy to do business with, more business will come your way. Thank you very much. Thank you.